All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kate Glenister. I'm one of the publishers for the new edition of Oxford Humanities, and I'm very excited to welcome you all here to today's session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Me personally, I'm on Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri Burong people. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Now, uh, Mark Easton has been our leading geography author here at Oxford for around 15 years, and he's made many valuable contributions to multiple geography, atlas and humanities books. I'm really excited to hand you over to him and dive into the importance of embedding skills from 7 to 10 humanities. So please take it away, Mark. OK, thank you, Kate, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge those people who have had a really tough couple of weeks um, up in the Dandenong Ranges and in, in Gippsland uh, with the storms. I'm hoping that the, the internet and the electricity allows you to uh, to join us today and you're really in my um, my thoughts at the moment with the tough time that you're having up there. Um, I just introduced myself, as, as Kate said, I've been working with uh, Oxford uh, University Press now for about 15 years, contributing to and writing um, mainly geography material, but also a little bit of history and a little bit of English, because they're my three um, teaching methods. For the last 17 years or so, I've been um, teaching at St Margaret's Berwick Grammar, a um, uh, independent girls and boys school uh, out in the southeastern suburbs. Uh, this year, I've got two year 12 geography classes and a year 11 history class. I usually have senior English as well, but it just hasn't worked out that way this year. Um, and what I'm going to do today is to uh, talk to you about what some of the stresses are uh, for teachers in humanities classrooms and classrooms in general, what we're calling pinch points. And I want to really focus in on, on skills. Um, I'll spend most of my time in, in part three. Um, like many of you, I've sat through many workshops and um, hoped that I could take something away that I could use in the class the next day or the next week or the next term rather than some uh, general idea. So I'm going to really try and uh, leave you with a set of skills that, that you can apply in the classroom uh, right from tomorrow. Um, once I get down to, to part four, I'm going to hand back to Kate um, and she's going to introduce you to the new Oxford Humanities series that we've been working on for the last 12 months or so. Uh, and you can see there's plenty of time at the end for, for any questions that uh, Kate, uh, myself or somebody else in the Oxford team would be happy to happy to, to answer. Um, so we're going to start off with talking about the, the pinch points, um, those areas of school life that cause us some problems. Um, there's probably not enough time in a 45 minute session to go through all the problems caused um, by today's um, modern school system, but um, geographers know exactly what pinch points look like. Um, we know what this ship is. This is the, the ever given 400 metres um, at 400 metres long is one of the largest uh, ships in the world that managed to wedge itself into the Suez Canal in March, um, bringing uh, much shipping in the world um, to a standstill. This is a superb illustration of what a what a pinch point is. It's a something that a, a place or an event that causes us difficulties uh, and it slow us down, uh, and in some cases, such as here, uh, cause us to to stop when all we want to do is keep um, progressing. And there's three key pinch points that I want to have a think about today and that we've been thinking about a lot when it comes to developing this um, second edition of the um, the uh, Oxford Humanities series. Um, and the first, the first of them, and I make no apology for starting with this, is the importance of teaching um, skills. I don't know about you, but whenever I sit down and look at a new curriculum, whether it's the revised um, Australian and Victorian curriculum that's open for discussion at the moment or previous iterations of uh, CSF and son of CSF and Australian curriculum and Victorian curriculum, I always tend to focus in on the content, um, looking at oh, what, what resources have I developed in the past that I could use again, which new ones do I need to bring in? Oh, there's my favourite topic, it's gone again. What happened to Antarctica? Bring back um, endangered animals. You know, I'm always focused on the content. Um, and sometimes that can be at the expense of the skills. But it's actually the skills that the Australian curriculum makes quite clear are the things that we need to give our students that they can carry forward more so than the content. And I'll give you an example of that um, in a moment. 
The second of the pinch points, and it comes as no surprise to anyone, uh, is time, uh, of course. I've been a head of humanities at, a, at various schools over uh, a couple of decades, and I've sat in many um, heads of department meetings and had to fight for time uh, for humanities. Um, I've never seen the head of maths or the head of English have to have to fight for time. It seems to be that when new things come into a school, that it's subjects like the humanities and um, art subjects in general that are often asked to give up time in order to fit in these um, wonderful new ideas. And so the response to that pressure from schools seems to be that our subjects have become semester length subjects or uh, elective subjects in some cases or combined subjects. Um, uh, I, I used to make the joke that so stood for stick on something extra. It sometimes feels like that being a humanities teacher that we keep getting asked to teach more and more with less and less time. So we thought about this when we're developing this new series and um, I'll give you some examples of that uh, as well. And the third pinch point is our mixed ability um, classrooms. Back when I began teaching in the, the 1980s, uh, I was told to pitch my lessons somewhere at the middle uh, in the hope that those um, below the middle uh, would pick up just enough to get close to the middle and that those ahead of the middle um, wouldn't get too bored waiting for me to catch up to them. We now know that that's not best practice. In fact, it's probably not even reasonable practice. It's probably unfair practice. And so we all strive to make our lessons uh, what a principal of mine once referred to as precise and personalised learning, that we are able to address each student's needs in every lesson for every skill. Now, that's a fine ideal, um, but almost impossible to achieve. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and work towards that ideal. Um, so there are, there are our three pinch points. And I want to really hone in um, on, on skills. And the first question to ask is, of course, is why are skills so important in the first place? Well, the skills are important because we follow a, a curriculum or a syllabus uh, that says they're important. There are as many skills, if not more, listed in the Australian and Victorian curricula um, as there are pieces of content. Uh, for instance, here's the year seven and eight achievement standard uh, for geography. So by the end of level eight or year eight, students are asked to be able to do an enormous number of things. And I've highlighted not all, but some of the verbs, some of the, the things that students are expected to do. What I noticed when I looked at this, and I just looked at it an hour or so ago again, is that how few things students are expected to know, but how many things they're expected to do. This really is a list of skills that students are expected to have, rather than a list of content that students are expected to have. And that's why skills are important. So that's the first reason that they're part of the, well, a key part of the curriculum um, that we follow. The other reason why skills are important is because they're portable. Um, it's fair to say that many of the things I learned at school, I've forgotten. Um, in fact, I can barely remember the subjects that I learned in some cases, but I can still hang on to some of the skills I was taught. Um, some of the mathematical skills, some of the mapping skills, some of the drawing and writing skills that I was taught at school. I've carried those with me long after I've forgotten what the novel was I read in year eight um, or the country I studied in year 10. It's the skills that have been portable that I've carried with me. I developed this idea in the first edition of this toolkit that um, students have this kit that they carry around with them. And when faced with a problem, either in geography or in another subject or in their life outside the classroom, they can dip into the toolkit and pull out the tool that they need in order to succeed at that task. Um, in fact, the, the um, declaration, the 2008 Melbourne Declaration, that underpins both the national and Victorian curriculum, um, brought in this new idea, well, it may not have been new, but it was stated for the first time that I'd seen, that schools are about developing deep learning, not surface learning, but deep learning. I can remember running workshops on deep learning way back in 2008, 2009, and one of the key aspects of deep learning is that students learn skills that are transferable um, the Melbourne Declaration uses that word transferable, that they can pick up skills and carry them with them. 
and we owe it to our students to give them these skills um, as much as we owe it to them to learn the content. Um, so that's why skills are important. Now, I want to give you a, a case study of um, a particular um, geographic skill. And I'm going to use this approach that we've um, been using, uh, writing this new series, developing this new series, uh, Oxford Humanities series, what we're calling the, the spiral approach. Uh, now, this is a spiral. We can think of it as a staircase. As we, we make our way up the staircase, we get higher and higher. And in this case, students get uh, better and better at mastering higher and higher skills. But importantly, as you go around the spiral, you revisit the same place again and again. You visit it there, you come around, you visit it there, but each time at a slightly higher level. So if we apply that to, to, to learning, um, say at year seven, students introduced to the core skills of humanity subjects. Um, I can remember when I started at, at um, my current school uh, in 2004, the first unit in year seven is, was, was a term on the skills of geography. Um, that's because we used to have a whole year uh, in order to teach it, to, to be able to teach geography. We don't have that time anymore. Um, and so now we embed the skills rather than do it as a standalone um, at the start. And we had to think carefully what were the core skills. So obviously being able to read, interpret and draw a map. Uh, some teachers refer to year seven as the bolts year, and it's those kind of core skills that students need to be able to develop. Uh, within their first year, um, because for many students, of course, depending on what primary school they went to, year seven is the first introduction to the word geography um, and the skills of the subject. And then we go up a level. They build on those skills. They they don't forget them and then just add more skills. They build on the school on those skills and then add on top of those and so on it goes. So up into year nine, um, they apply those skills that they've learnt. Um, into year nine, up into year 10. And by the end of year 10, we need them to have mastered the skills of geography. Now, we know because we're realists that at the end of year 10, the journey has ended in geography, uh, as it has in history, as it has for many humanities subjects um, for students. But some of them, of course, go on to VCE, um, history, geography, and the other humanities subjects. And we need them to have a particular set of skills that they start each of those VCE studies with. And of course, beyond um, that, students go into career fields like planning and drafting, um, international relations, international studies, um, and of course, the pinnacle uh, geography teaching, of course. Uh, another metaphor that I've used once before um, when I was talking to, um, talking to my uh, uh, geography department was it's a little like a cycling race. Um, this is the Tour de France, this is the 2011 Tour de France, and this is uh, Cadell Evans here uh, coming up the Champs-Élysées. Uh, you can see the Arc de Triomphe in the background there. Uh, in 2011, he became the first Australian to win this race. To win it, he had to cycle for three weeks and cover three and a half thousand kilometres. Now, most people who watch the Tour de France think of it as an individual event. They see masses of cyclists in different coloured clothing slogging their way up hills, down valleys and across rivers and assume that the fastest rider has the best chance of winning, that each of these riders has the potential to win the race, that it is an individual event. But it's not. The more you watch cycling, the more you realise that it's not an individual event. It is like teaching a team event. Cadell Evans is a member of a team, as each of the cyclists are a member of a team. Each team has got nine members. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven members of this team. And they these six in the front here are all riding for this seventh rider. He's their best rider. He's the one given the greatest chance of winning the Tour de France. And it's their job, the six riders in the front here, and the two at the back who are picking up water bottles or dropping off jumpers, picking up raincoats, getting tactics from the team car. It's their job to give this one rider the best possible chance of success. In cycling, it's to reach the bottom of the biggest climb, having done the least amount of work. It's the job of eight cyclists to get the ninth cyclist to the base of this climb back here, here the Alpe d'Huez in France, with the very best chance of winning. 
And it's the same in teaching. It's not an individual event. It's a team event. Here's another way of thinking about it. Here's a cross section of that, that uh, stage. Um, it's wonderful not to have to explain what a cross section is. For students, year seven, year eight, a series of hills. Um, and one way of thinking about it is teachers sacrifice themselves to teach the students the skills they need in order to reach this point here with the skills that they need in order to climb the VCE mountain. The team needs to work together, not individually, without any idea of what the others are doing in order to give their student or their best rider the best possible chance of success at climbing the VCE mountain. If you're sitting in a year nine classroom and you've got no idea of what the VCE mountain looks like, your students are going to get to this point here, perhaps without one of the skills they need in order to succeed. But if you've had a chat to the year seven teacher or you are the year seven teacher as well, then you've got a better idea of knowing what do they already know? What extra skill have they had added? What can I add in order to get them to this point with the best possible um, chance of success? Let me give you an example of this. I'm going to use I'm going to use Google Earth um, to to um, demonstrate this. Um, if we were doing this in a, in a in a workshop setting, if we were sitting in a lecture theatre somewhere, I may not use Google Earth, but because we're we're sitting here online, um, this is something I can do from home uh, to show you this. So let's look at the mountain first of all. Where do students need to be at the beginning of VCE? What's the VCE journey? when it comes to spatial technologies. Well, it's actually quite complex. The students are expected to be able to master a quite advanced set of skills. They've got to be able to create layers or overlays, the same thing, on a map or diagram. We're going to use Google Earth as our map here. They've got to be able to use these layers to illustrate uh, and uh, assist and analyze. And then they've got to be able to manipulate the platform they're using, in this case, Google Earth, being able to view and hide layers, add and remove layers, be able to change the scale. That's quite a complex series of skills. You wouldn't ask a student in the first week of year seven uh, to master those skills. And yet, by the time they reach the top of the VCE mountain in VCE geography, students are expected to be able to master each of those skills. The journey doesn't begin here. It begins back in year seven. I'm going to show you how um, I've developed a series of skills for the Oxford Humanities series um, to get students to that VCE mountain with the best set of skills that they could have. So, for instance, year seven, the beginning of the journey. I asked them to do a couple of things here. I'm just going to pull out some examples from the Oxford Humanities series. Uh, in the water unit, so the first unit for most students at uh, uh, year seven geography, I simply asked them to explore the Nile River in, in Egypt and make a connection between the river and water and uh, population distribution patterns. Um, and having been able to, to do that, they've got about a locator place, uh, zoom into a place, fly along a place, perhaps drop a place mark, they're beginning to become familiar with that interface with Google Earth. And then once they've done that in the second unit, which for most students is livability, depending how your, your units are organized, uh, I ask them to add something to the map to perhaps um, we might do a piece of local area field work, an area circling their house or circling your school uh, in order to count the number of hospitals, chemists, doctors, churches and so on. So they can compare livability of, of different places. And I'm going to show you just in, um, if you're not too familiar with Google Earth, um, how I might go about this. So the first skill, um, unit one in year seven then, was simply to be able to locate a place. Now I've loaded mine up uh, ahead of time. I'm working on the assumption that most of you know how to, how to locate a place using the search button up here. And having got the view you want, you simply use this tool here to drop a pin uh, and label that pin. And I've already labeled mine, um, the Nile River here. And I might start my tour in, on, in the Aswan High Dam. So I'm going to start down here uh, in the south of Egypt so I can see this dam, which uh, was built in the, in the 1960s by NASA. And I can see Nasser, not NASA. Uh, and I can see the, the way in which this has obviously changed the landscape. Dam's been built, 
control flooding downstream, to try and control the annual flooding of the Nile, uh, but also to provide water for, for irrigation and population and so on. And of course, once that's been built, I've got an airport sitting out here. I've got the town of Aswan um, sitting over here and I can explore that and then click on the eye and hold the eye and I can fly along. Sorry, on the hand I meant, not the eye. I can fly along the Nile just by slowly moving that along until I can get an idea of the, the general pattern here. I can see, oh, wherever there's the river, there seems to be uh, irrigated fields. There seems to be little farms here. There seems to be little villages uh, over here. I can begin seeing it if I can zoom right in and start seeing a series of canals uh, and so on. So that's the first skill is locating a place, dropping a pin on that place or a place mark as it's called in Google Earth and then being able to uh, manipulate the screen by using this little hand here to fly along. And I can see, I can go to interesting places like the the, uh, the ancient pyramids. I can see that water has uh, been a major influence on settlement patterns uh, of Egypt for um, you know, thousands of years, not just hundreds of years. Some weird reason Google Earth wants to float the Great Pyramid slightly above where they actually sit. Um, and then I can, something that I just noticed before when I was setting this up over here in the in the western desert I can see a different use of water over here and so I saw those the connection with the Nile but over here these are these irrigated fields um, from the artesian water uh, deep deep beneath the desert um, using these pivot sprays here so there's some new technologies uh, so that's the first of the skills and the second of the skills in year seven is to be able to add something to a map. So all I did with that first skill was to find a place and explore a place. But this time I'm going to add a piece of information. Conscious of the year seven, sorry, the VCE mountain. The VCE mountain I needed to be able to add a layer. Now this is the simplest of layers, but I'm going to add a circle. And I'm just choosing South Geelong because that's the example I use in the in the in the textbook. I quite like South Geelong as an example because it's got a good um, uh, collection of community facilities, parks and football ovals and um, Cardinia Park down there and um, supermarkets and the Deakin University on the waterfront and so on. So I'm going to do a, a field work within one kilometre of my house. Now apologies to anyone out here who is house that actually is, I've just chosen it at random. So in order to draw a circle, I get that in the, as much in the middle of the screen as I possibly can. I use the ruler tool up here I ask it to draw a circle. I make sure I've got kilometres as my unit, so I'm not working miles or feet. I click on that, and then I just pull that out until I reach a kilometre. Click on that. I can move away from that. I can save that circle, call it my field work site. Um, so, uh, and then that'll save down into the into the menu over there. I haven't got my keyboard set up at the moment. So, in that way, I've been able to draw um, a circle on the map. So, I'm beginning. The, the journey, I'm keeping in mind where students need to be at the VCE level. They need to create simple layers. And here I was doing it for them in year seven. In year eight, I go a step further. So I work my way a little further up the spiral staircase. Um, they know how to locate a place. They know how to add a really simple layer here. Now I teach them an additional skill or two additional skills. In the landform unit, um, I'm going to ask them to use another tool that sits within the Google Earth interface, which is a digital elevation model or a digital um, terrain model. So making sure the terrain button is switched on in your layers um, down here, you can explore uh, landscapes in 3D. So this is a contour map that's been draped onto a digital model called a digital elevation or digital um, terrain model. In the textbook, I um, explore the Swiss Alps and the, the shaping of the Swiss Alps by um, glaciation. And one of the questions I ask students is if you had to climb Mount Iger, um, where would you approach it from? What's the, what's the easiest way to climb Mount Iger? And they begin to see these ridges uh, that make their way up the mountain. Or maybe I could start down here on this glacier and make my way up through the snowfield up to this glacier. But what if I wanted a challenge? What if I wanted to really climb the hardest face of Mount Iger. Now using this 
that the compass rose up here, I can see that I'm looking north. North is at the top of the map. So it's as if I'm sitting here in my ch chair in the south looking towards the north. What about if I swung it around? If I click and hold on the north, I can swing that around and I can just do a bit of a drag there and I can see the north face of the Iger, which you see is a very forbidding face here. It's been, and I can talk about how it's been truncated by a glacier that's come through it, carved off that edge there and how that's a much more forbidding face um, in order to climb. Using the year seven skill I talked to before, clicking on the hand and using the north arrow, so adding those two skills, I can turn around and fly up these valleys now and start exploring U-shaped valleys and truncated spurs and arets and cirques and all the various uh, glacial landforms. So that's the next skill. Um, in the year nine, sorry, the year eight unit on uh, coastal change in management, uh, I have a look at Curtis Island. Now, Curtis Island is on the Great Barrier Reef. It's in the Coral Sea. So here's the, you can see parts of the reef out here. Uh, and this, it's near the port of Gladstone. So this is Gladstone. And Gladstone um, is a rapidly growing port. Um, it's a, one of the places where coal is exported. And you can see other minerals sitting here in these stockpiles. Uh, waiting to be exported. Here's some coal here at the Port of Gladstone uh, waiting to be exported. But the the um, mineral resource I focus on here is the liquefied natural gas plants. And there's three of them here on Curtis Island. The skill I ask students to do is to explore the change that's happened. Of course, the best way to explore change is what did this place look like in the past? Now, most geography teachers, I think, know about the historic imagery tool. Uh, but in case you don't, here it is up here. So down here it shows me that I've got historic imagery available for the site from 1985. And I can access it by clicking on this clock up here. It gives me a slider. I can go back in 1985. And Curtis Island, you can see Gladstone was quite a different looking place, as was Curtis Island. Perhaps a natural clearing there, but Curtis Island was largely untouched. Uh, there's an interesting happens to, thing happens to this um, this um, gantry here as well. And then I can move that slider forward. I can begin to discover the changes that happened. So 1990, things pretty much um, as they were. By 2003, some land has been reclaimed down here. Perhaps this becomes a staging point um, to redevelop um, Curtis Island. And then as I jump forward to 2013, uh, I can see this area has become much larger and the land has been cleared and the um, LNG plants at Curtis Island are now um, well in train. So using that historic imagery tool, students can explore um, change over time. The VCE mountain asks students to manipulate the interface. It's just another way of changing the way, saying changing the way that it looks. Using historic imagery is an example of that. Um, you can also ask students to copy images from, from different time periods. The way to copy is to go into the edit and copy that image. Um, and then they can go back in time and copy the same place, say in 2006. Once again, copy the image and it copies what it is on the screen. It doesn't always default back to um, the, the place as it is as it is today. So that's year eight. Same set of skills or same basic idea, still working with spatial technologies. But here we've lifted it a level. Um, by year nine, I'm asking students to go um, a step further. Um, year nine unit that does this really well is interconnections. Um, in, the, in the textbook, uh, I look at the uh, port of Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai is one of the world's largest um, uh, container ports uh, because, of course, China is the world's largest exporter. Uh, and the container port used to be here in the, the mouth of the river. Um, but now, well, that's actually the airport container ports further up here. But so much has now been exported from Shanghai that a new port had to be built. So a deep water port has been built out here uh, in the bay. So this is now the largest container terminal uh, in the world. Um, you can see here the ships being unloaded. There's one, two, three, is that seven, three, four, five, couple of small ones there, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
ships being unloaded at the moment. And there seems to be something being built out here, perhaps that will be the next container port. Um, because students already know how to um, look at historic imagery, we can look at how this area has changed over time. We can go back to 1985 and see it was just a series of low lying tidal islands in um, Shanghai Bay. And um, within that relatively short period, 17, 18 years, um, this port has been built and grown. But there's no point building a port on an island um, you need to be able to connect it to the mainland. So one of the world's longest um, ship, uh, not ship, shorter island islands, island bridges, is this Donghai Bridge uh, from Shanghai here out to this deep water port. The skill I ask students to do here, so I've shown them historic imagery in year eight. In year nine, I need them to go a step further. So I build the skill, I work my way up the spiral. This time I'm going to measure the length of that bridge. So using the same tool as I use for the circle, I'm going to measure the distance from the toll uh, gantry here uh, to the island down here. Now, it's not a straight line. We always know how annoying that is whenever we want to teach about scale, but Google Earth allows us to measure a path. So if I click on the start there, which is the gantry there, it sets up that blue button and I click down here and I click here and I can bend my path around with as many points as I like, adds them all together and gives me a distance of 28 and a half kilometres. Whoa, that is a long bridge. I could go back to the place where I live, South Geelong, measure a distance from my house for 28.64 kilometres. So students have got an idea of what that looks like um, in their world. So that's the next level. That's the next skill. You can see this is how the skill is outlined in the, in the textbook. Um, it teaches students how to use the ruler. It asks them to zoom in, um, estimate the size, the length and width of the container port. Um, it go back historic imagery, look back over time. So now I'm bringing together all the skills they learned in seven, eight, and now in year nine. Um, and that leads on to, to uh, year 10. In year 10, the skill I show them and I, I just showed this to one of my um, colleagues um, the other day in, in our staff room uh, and she got so excited by it. I think she's just about teaching all her lessons with it um, these days. And that's to make a movie. Um, and the example I use in the year 10 textbook is the environmental change in management from uh, the production of a mobile phone. So I look at three sites um, where materials are taken from or in the mind in each of these cases actually in order to produce uh, the modern mobile phone. So I've got my phone sitting here with me. I think there's 27 minerals uh, in a mobile phone and one of those is uh, cobalt. Most of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it comes from large mines like this or small artisanal mines um, out in the forest, but I'm going to use this as my example. So I've loaded each of these in uh, ahead of time. Um, and I've dropped the pin on them so I can find them easily. So there's the cobalt mine. Um, the world's largest graphite mine is here uh, in China near the um, border with North Korea. Um, and then the final one is the uh, lithium salt pond. So my lithium ion battery is made either with lithium from Australia or lithium from Chile. Um, Chile is the world's largest lithium producer and they produce lithium from beneath the Atacama Desert. Uh, they pump it out. It's been dissolved in water um, below the desert. Um, they pump it out and then dry the uh, the mineral in these large uh, evaporation ponds. Uh, they've got to do that four times or three or four times in order for the mineral to be concentrated enough to be able to use. And then, of course, it has to be taken um, by a railway line actually from the Atacama Desert uh, through some pretty forbidding sort of territory over here to Antofagasta. Uh, OK, so I put each of those three places uh, together and I've created a tour or made a movie, as I like to tell kids. The way to do this is to click on this movie icon up here and then to start recording. And once I push that red button there, it records every move I make on the on the screen. Um, here's the one I made earlier on with the mobile phone tour. I always like to start at a place they know and you can see I'm not touching anything now. No hands. So this is the tour I recorded earlier. So I click on the cobalt mine, zooms into that. 
then I would talk to kids about the cobalt mine. I'll just go through this one pretty quickly. And then I shoot over to the graphite mine in uh, northern China and talk about the impact of graphite, particularly on air pollution and the impact of that on the people of the area. And then I go over to the lithium salt ponds of Chile. Uh, now I find that kids love the making these tours and they're fantastic for presentations um, that students give the class. So my year 10 class, I haven't got one this year, but in previous years I give students an example of environmental change and ask them to research it and present it to the class. And uh, so many of them just give me a PowerPoint. As soon as I taught them the skill of making a, a, a um, Google Earth tour like this, presentations just became so much better. You can add photographs, you can add a commentary, you can show the historic imagery, you can use the digital terrain models. Um, once you teach kids the basic skill of this, um, because they're digital natives, they'll quickly learn all the various parts you can add to it. And you can see sitting over here that I use this um, Google Earth tours for lots of my teaching. I've got a tour on the causes of deforestation in the Amazon. I've even got one down here on the, the war in the Pacific, uh, which shows um, Pearl Harbor and Iwo Jima and, and places like that. So by the time my students get to um, year, um, get to year uh, 11 into VCE, They've learned an enormous amount of skills with um, this particular um, spatial technology. So by the time they come to VCE, they've created some layers. They've used those layers to illustrate um, spatial relationships, even way back in year seven when they were looking at the link between water and population in Egypt. They were analyzing spatial relationships and in many different ways they've manipulated the way the interface of the GIS platform. They've turned layers. Um, off and on. They've added layers, they've chosen different scales until finally when they get to, to VCE and they think surely there's no more that can be learnt now with, um, with Google Earth, um, how wrong they are because I can find layers from elsewhere on the internet um, and add them. Here's a layer from the uh, University of Zurich um, that I found uh, on the internet that shows the change over time of uh, the world's ice. And you can see if those of you who teach year 12 geography will instantly recognize um, what I can use this for. This is the ice cover in the last glacial maximum. And I can pull the slider forward here. As I pull the slider forward, the amount of um, CO2 in the atmosphere changes, as does the temperature. The um, sea level begins to rise, and as does the world's population. So by the time I get to about today, and it's always hard to land right on, here we are, close enough, 2000, the world's population has reached 7 billion. Um, average temperature is you know, sitting up there. Um, CO2 has increased and the amount of um, uh, ice, of course, has decreased. And then another layer, which will go to quite seamlessly, is I can drag it forward and see the prediction about ice for the next um, thousand years or so. So, that journey, though, didn't begin in year 11 or year 12. That journey began in year seven. So that's what I mean by the, the spiral pattern, this revisiting of skills and building up a new level on each occasion. So students reach the base of the VCE mountain confident and ready to go. And then, of course, that's not just with spatial technologies, but um, a wide range of skills. So that's hopefully given you some ideas about how to intentionally coordinate the teaching of skills. So there's a deliberate, and I've written these words down to make sure I really focus on them. You deliberate and intentionally plan a progression of skills, not a random series of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I did that digital terrain thing now and half my kids don't know anything about it and half are already sick of it, that I've really intentionally um, progressed students through that. Um, skill development. So I'm hoping that's um, that's useful to you in lots of ways. So I'll hand back to Kate now. She wants to introduce you to some of the key components of the new Oxford Humanities series. So over to you, Kate. Thank you, Mark. That was awesome. Um, so hi again, everyone. I'm back, like Mark said, to introduce you to our new editions of Oxford Humanities. Um, this is uh, very much a continuation of our much-loved Oxford Big Ideas uh, Humanities series. We're very excited to have sort of 
moved away from the big ideas phrase and just go forward with these next edition as, you know, proudly being just Oxford Humanities. So you can see here our brand new covers. We've uh, moved away from the faces on the covers and wanted to have the idea of students sort of living and breathing in the world of humanities. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So all the humanities titles do have um, geography, history, economics and business and civics and citizenship in them from seven to 10. Um, but we're also very excited to bring back a second edition of the standalone uh, economics and business and civics and citizenship book at years nine and 10, just to offer a bit more flexibility for those of you who might be doing electives in these subjects in the later years. We, um, you know, had that idea of students living and breathing um, their subject on the cover and thought, you know, what more demonstrates that in civics than, uh, you know, people living uh, the, the civic action of protest. So we have a very moving image here on the cover from a Black Lives Matter protest that took place last year. Next slide, please. So I'm going to dive in in the next few slides and talk you through some of the new and improved features in the new series. I say new and improved because we have worked really hard and thought very carefully about bringing across and retaining the features that we thought uh, worked really well. We've done a lot of um, interviews and had a lot of conversations with many of you to try and hear what you loved and to also hear what we could improve and uh, add in. So without further ado, let's dive in. All right, so here we have a um, uh, opening of a chapter. Uh, the example here is uh, chapter three in year eight, Mountain Landscapes. You can see we have a really new, clean and spacious design that is carried across through uh, the rest of the chapter and the whole book. Um, we've retained the three sort of overarching questions that guide and structure each chapter. So um, here the case is how are mountain landscapes formed, how are mountain landscapes used and managed, and uh, mountain landscapes hazardous places. We think uh, this is a great way of sort of helping students um, understand the content from the syllabus in a, in a nice narrative form that they can understand and that also makes it um, a bit uh, easier for you guys to open up the book and dive in with them. Next slide, please. Just before I change slides, I will say as the author of this chapter that uh, I and probably the other authors spend a long time finding an image that will engage the students from the very start that will get them already questioning what it is they're going to to learn about. So we call this the hook page because it hopefully it hooks students into it. Sorry, Kate, felt like telling you that. Oh, no, absolutely. And that is such a, a breathtaking image as well. What a beautiful way to open the chapter. Um, OK, so here's an example of a, um, a beginning of a, a topic in our um, chapter. So we've retained the topic based approach. Uh, so any given chapter will have, you know, 3.1, 3.2, etc with the mind that, you know, a topic uh, hopefully equals a lesson, depending on how you want to approach it. Um, you'll see there a new feature in the top left hand side. We have introduced a learning outcomes box. So, uh, yes, whatever uh, the, the function of the learning outcomes box is essentially to set up what you're going to be doing in the topic um, and provide a bit of direction, both for you as the teacher and for the student using the book to know in this I'm going to be doing this and hopefully by the end of it I'll be able to, you know, describe the impact of humans on mountain landscapes. On the right hand side you can see um, a new feature in that yellow box, the visible thinking prompt. Um, many of you will probably be familiar with visible thinking prompts. I believe they originated out of Harvard University and the idea is that um, you can use them to encourage students to think uh, independently and critically and develop their own patterns of thought. So these appear sparingly but thoughtfully throughout the books, um, often in response to a source, so getting them to look at a source and see what they uh, think about it. Um, there are different uh, prompts, including see, think, wonder, think, pair, share, I used to think, now I think, things like that. Um, below that, you can see a case study box. We had case studies in the previous editions, but we're excited to have revamped and updated a lot of these to bring the content from the syllabus to life in a really recent and engaging way. Next slide, please. 
Um, here we have an example of how skills have been integrated into these new additions. So on the right hand side there you can see a key skill box. These sit within topics um, to really bring uh, the skills to life in context of the content the students are learning. So the example here is a spread from the ancient Rome chapter in year seven. Uh, they're learning about the role of women in that society and as they go we have inserted a little box about how to analyze different perspectives um, and that just sort of does a bit of hand holding on developing that skill while they're actually learning about the role of women. So the extract and the source that they're looking at uh, tells them a certain perspective on the role of women and encourages them to um, practice that skill while they're learning about that content. You can also see just below that, that little blue box, we have a icon that actually calls out um, further support for this that will be available on our digital platform. We're really excited, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a little bit, but we're really excited that for this uh, new edition, we're relaunching our digital platform with um, a bunch of new exciting features. And one of these is a closer integration between the book and the digital platform. Um, so here, for example, they're reading about the role of women in ancient Rome, they're practicing the skill of analyzing perspectives, and you as the teacher also know that there's further support for that online um, in the form of a worksheet. Next slide, please. Great, so here on the left, you can see that we have brand new margin glossary terms um, on the page. This is something we're really excited about because a lot of teachers told us that they would love to see this appear in our books. Um, it really works to support uh, literacy and support students at different levels and of course takes the hassle out of flipping back and forth from the back of the book. Um, on the right hand side you can see a key concept box. Uh, the example here is continuity and change in uh, the history chapter uh, Japan under the shoguns in year eight. These key concept boxes help take the concepts from the syllabus and bring them to life uh, in context of what the uh, topic is about. And below that you can see we have our check your learning box. This is something that appeared in the previous edition as well. It still follows the three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So sort of, you know, medium, that sort of low, medium, high uh, approach. Um, but something that we're really excited about uh, in terms of the development of skills is bringing in and familiarizing students with task words um, from a younger uh, year, from younger years. This was again feedback that we heard from teachers that would be really good to be able to familiarize students with words like identify and describe instead of the classic who, what, when, where, why. At year seven and eight, there's still very much a mix of both of those, but then when we get into years nine and 10, we sort of encourage students to work more independently with those task words. And we also have included a glossary of terms for these task words uh, to support students in developing their knowledge of them so that they can get to know them uh, while they go. Next, please. Uh, so here we also have a rich task. These appear in our uh, previous editions as well. We have revamped these to include uh, new skills practice, uh, new topics. They are really great because they offer depth as well as differentiation and skills practice, three things that we all know are very important. So these are coming back, um, back and better than ever as well. Next, please. And something we're really excited about is that we've introduced a chapter review spread at the end of each chapter. So we felt it was important to um, uh, introduce a bit of a bookend, I pardon the pun, to the end of each chapter. Um, and we've done this with a review spread. So uh, there are two components to this. On the left hand side, there are some review questions and these appear again in that nice sort of narrative flow from the uh, from the chapter uh, organized under those three big questions um, and they encourage students to consolidate the knowledge that the chapter um, has taken them through and then on the right hand side we have a chapter review activity now no matter if you're in geography or history or economics or civics um, this always includes a stimulus so it might be a map or a graph or here it's a source 
um, from Shogunate Japan, it might be a media extract, whatever it is, and then encourage your students to um, practice their sort of source analysis skills and engage with that source by responding to it and applying the knowledge they've learnt um, by answering the questions with it. Everything on this page also includes um, marks assigned to them and a marking rubric that will be available for you online in the O book as well. These will also be available as customizable and downloadable documents. So if you feel like you have um, you know, opportunities for differentiation where you'd like to add some questions or change some or swap some things out. Um, it's very much uh, packaged up as like a ready-made and customizable sort of end of unit assessment for you to use. And then the last thing on the page there is a panel that just highlights some more of our important digital resources for the chapter, um, just to signpost to you that there are some great things that you might like to use to help tie in um, how you're teaching the chapter. Next, please. The other thing I'd say about this, the other thing I'd say about these spreads is they'd be superb work to leave for extras. They're meant to be sort of standalone pieces of work with students provided with stimulus uh, and then the questions. So something I was keeping in mind when I was working on them. Absolutely. Um, something else that I wanted to mention that will appear in the print book that will appear at the back of the book, so it's not interfering with what you're doing when you're teaching the actual content in the actual chapters, um, are STEAM projects. So they will be um, six pages in each book from seven to ten that will sit at the very back of the book and um, they are projects that have been very carefully designed with expert authors to address content from the humanities curriculum really meaningfully. Um, the benefit of this, because we know that cross-curricular teaching is very, very difficult, is that there are these projects are identical in our humanities, science and maths books. Um, you can, of course, just treat it as a humanities project because it has been written to address the curriculum. But if you did want to chat to your maths or your science teachers and approach that as a cross-curricular or a STEAM um, project, then that's totally up to you. We've given you the choice. Um, again, on the O book, there will be a totally comprehensive suite of um, teacher resources such as videos, um, implementation advice, teacher notes, assessment tools, um, and other things like that to help you uh, figure out how you'd like to use these spreads. Next slide, please. Um, like I said earlier, we're really excited because we are really upping the ante with our digital platform with these new additions. Uh, some of the exciting features I just wanted to call out. Um, we will, of course, still have the full range of teacher support materials like teacher notes and lesson plans, um, student book answers, worksheets, all things like that. But um, I did want to mention that we have uh, moved to integrate these titles with Learnosity. Um, which means that we can really, uh, we'll be able to supply some really fun and engaging interactive activities to help your students um, work through the course and support uh, their knowledge as well. And on the right hand side there you can see this functionality allows us to also offer reporting and tracking for you to help track your students' progress. So an example of one of the reports that will be available is a curriculum based report. So you can see how the questions that they've been doing um, actually relate to um, the curriculum and how they actually address the knowledge and the skills from the curriculum, which is really exciting. Next, please. And finally, I did just want to mention on the digital as well, um, we're really excited to say that these books will be integrated with Quizlet. I'm sure Quizlet is something that a lot of you already know and love and use in your classroom. It's an awesome learning tool that um, I know students absolutely love. Um, the great thing for us with integrating our titles with Quizlet is that we can offer uh, Oxford expert authored quality content um, via the Quizlet platform. So whether you want to host a game of Quizlet live for your students, like the example there on the phone, or if you want to encourage them to study independently with any of the other study methods that Quizlet offer, um, it will be up to you. But the opportunity exists for all of the Oxford content um, to be hosted on Quizlet and you can use it how you like. Next slide, please. So uh, all of this uh, is to say and to have shown you uh, what the books look like 
is to take it back to the pinch points that Mark uh, raised at the beginning of the session. Now, I'm not going to read all of these out um, verbatim, but we just wanted to uh, sort of reinforce the fact that we have uh, made all of our decisions really carefully to try and address these pinch points. So whether it's, you know, the enhanced focus on skills with those key skill boxes, um, whether it's the chapter review activities acting as sort of self-contained, customizable assessments, uh, whether it's the glossary definitions and the Quizlet support and the all everything that I've just gone through, all of that has been really carefully planned to hopefully take some of the um, the pinch or some of the pain out of um, what you're experiencing as humanities teachers. So, um, yeah, we just sort of circle back to that. And I think that takes, oh yeah, the product information, I'll just um, run through that really quickly. Um, I just wanted to give the opportunity to, to take you through the pricing and the formats of how these books are available to purchase. So each book, um, as you can buy each book for $65.95, and that of course comes with access to the Oxford digital account for the student through the price of the book. Um, if you're looking to be just digital only and you don't want the physical copy of the book, that's $45.95. And then the Teacher O Book account is $299.95 with access to that huge range of digital support. I thought it was important to mention, especially having mentioned the STEAM spreads at the back of the book, we do also um, offer these in value packs, which um, include Oxford Humanities, Oxford Science, Oxford Math and Oxford My English, and they're very competitively priced. Um, you can do digital only for $107.95 or print and digital for $164.95. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have the standalone Economics and Business, Civics and Citizenship book at years nine and ten, um, just to offer a bit more flexibility. Um, and the book is $54.95 or the digital only is $39.95. Um, and of course, if you've got any more questions about um, pricing or you want to know a little bit more about how that works, we will show a slide a bit uh, in a few slides time with our sales consultants details on them. So I think that takes us to um, question time. And I've got a few questions that I've pulled from the chat for you, Mark, but we'll begin with a question from Brendan Hollier. And he said, hi, Mark, great point about the mixed ability squeeze. Can you please explain, explain graphicacy further? Oh, so um, graphicacy is the ability to express yourself in other than words or numbers. So it, the best example in geography is mapping. So maps, graphs, pictures, um, AVDs, these are all examples of graphicacy. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, Brendan again has asked if there's a template that you use at your school to map out each skill progression from year seven to VCE. And I think I might just say, um, I mentioned in the chat earlier because someone else asked whether we would go through all the skills and obviously we don't have time for that today because it's one session. Um, but we do, we are planning to uh, include sort of like a skills mapping chart to show how these books address that progression. Um, and we'll have a bit more information on that in the coming weeks to be able to provide that to you. So it will be available, just not sure in which format um, at the moment. The other thing I'll say about that is with the uh, the first edition of the Oxford Atlas, there was a, a um, workbook that uh, you could buy with that and that had a list of all the uh, geography skills as I understood them at that time and I mapped out a progression from year seven to year 10 in the front of that book so you could uh, you could track down a copy of that so that I think it was called the workbook the uh, Oxford Atlas workbook yeah I'm not sure if that one's still in print but I'll investigate that after this session and have a look I've got a copy <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll have a look at your bookshelf we'll raid your bookshelf <laughs> um, Carly has just asked, I think this one's for me, will the Australian curriculum textbooks be updated? If yes, when, when will they be available? I'll just say, Carly, we're focusing on the Victorian um, series this year and we don't know what the coming years holds, but we'll keep everyone updated as soon as we know what's happening. Um, and there's a couple of questions just about um, proof copies. So. Um, 
we have a sample chapter just about ready to go, which is exciting, and that will be emailed to you probably um, at the start of next week. We we're hoping to get it out with the session today, but we're just making some final touches. Um, in terms of proof copies, they'll be coming probably uh, in a few weeks' time, probably more like July, um, August time. Um, but again, I would encourage you to keep in touch with your sales consultants. Um, and I think if you flick to a couple slides time mark, we've got their details up on the screen. So hopefully you all know Russell, Alicia, Dave and David. Um, if you don't, feel free to uh, drop a line in the chat now and I can take your name and get you in touch with them. Um, or otherwise, you can go to oup.com.au forward slash contact and um, find out who's the consultant for your area. But um, either way, if you need anything, just get in touch and um, we will make sure that your consultant uh, follows up with you. Mark, thank you so much. You're an awesome presenter. We're so glad to have you on the team. That's okay. I enjoyed it. And um, thank you all so much. Have a lovely afternoon.